Welcome to Willard Church of the Nazarene. We're glad you're here. We can't wait to share the service with you. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape, but he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that we could in our way, but he came and he died. And he rose, those giants are dead now. And this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God. that fear that took our breath away faith so weak that we could barely pray but he heard every word every whisper now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness never once did he fail and he never will. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. From that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him, this is our God, this is who He is, He loves us, this is our God. What he does, he saves us. He bore the cross and beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross and beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus.
deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God
It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forever.
We're going to be in Genesis 15. Genesis 15. Are, are you... Have you come here expectant to hear from the Lord? Like, I don't know you, but like, I'm excited to come to church and to hear w- what God is going to share with us. And I hope you have that same attitude. I hope, you, I hope you're praying about it. I hope you're praying that your heart is soft to receive it, that your eyes and ears are open to hear the truth, right? And that God speaks in a mighty way to you, that the Holy Spirit speaks in a mighty way to you. There's, there's no coincidences when it comes to God. And I believe he has a message here for us that is just critical for us to. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm praying that we receive it. I'm praying that we hear it today. Genesis 15. This, this passage contains what we refer to as a theophany. A theophany is a scene in which the God of the universe manifests himself in some physical or audible way here on this earth. Fancy term just means that God shows up, right? It's in the Old Testament. We're in Genesis. St. Augustine said that the Old Testament is like a fully furnished room that is just poorly lit. In the Old Testament, there are all these beautiful things, but they're kind of hard to see unless you open a window and let light in from the New Testament to see it. When you, when you look at the Old Testament from the standpoint of, of where we stand today, from the standpoint of the New Testament, you see all sorts of really amazing things. I love the Old Testament. Sometimes people want to steer clear of it. But there's so many things that we can learn, so many really amazing things that we can see. And and what we see in this passage and in other places where where God manifests himself in some dramatic way, some physical way, right? It points to the ultimate expression of God manifesting himself on earth in the form of Jesus Christ. In other words, every theophany points us to him. And teaches us something about him. What we'll see today, I think, is incredible. I think is life changing. But you gotta pay attention, all right? Because it's not the easiest to see, and you're gonna have to do that. All right. Genesis 15, beginning at verse 1, would you stand in honor of God's word? After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took, him out, he took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these things to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Skip down to verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I will give this land From the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadamanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. This, my friends, 
is the word of the Lord. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, reveal your truths to us. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Let us have soft hearts to hear. Let us have eyes and ears to respond. And let us take what we learn in here and let it change us to look more like you. And Father, send us out into this world with this message. Lord, we give you praise and all honor. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so a lot in this passage. It's a little weird at the end, right? A little... I, I know I've read this when I was first, you know, learning about this stuff, and I was like, what in the world is that? But we'll get to that. And I think you're going to see that this is one of the most amazing passages of Scripture. It's one that uh, we all have to get. We all have to understand this one, right? Because it's r- a really important part of our relationship with God. The reason why God shows up in verse 1 and says, don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm going to call him Abraham. His name right here is Abram. God hasn't changed his name yet, but just just bear with me because I'm so used to that. But it's because in the chapter before this, Abraham has just rescued his nephew Lot from a bunch of tribal chieftains, and he's afraid of retaliation. He's afraid that they're going to attack him back or somebody else is going to attack him. This is a barbaric time. This is a dog-eat-dog time. This is a time of of clans and tribes. And and like I said, he's just afraid that they're going to retaliate or somebody else is going to attack him. And God comes in a vision and says this to him. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Before that, when it says that the word of the Lord came to Abraham, it is the only place in the Pentateuch, the only place in the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, that we're told that the word of the Lord came to someone. This is something that happens generally to prophets, right? The word of the Lord came to this prophet. In other words, it was very clear what was the message, very audible, an extremely strong statement of God. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your very great reward. But realize this. In spite of how clear it is, in spite of this assurance, Abraham immediately responds in verse 2 and 3, thank you very much for this word from the Lord, but right? But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. In other words, God, you made this amazing promise to me But Abraham's saying, how can I be sure, though, that you'll carry it out when I'm still childless, right? In other words, I have my doubts about you and your ability, God. God responds in this very famous passage that we all know, right? This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside. Right? Can you imagine this late at night? We live in a great place to see the stars. I'm from Chicago, and you don't see the stars there. Right? Uh, this is a great place that you can see all those stars. He took them outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Right? Then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. So I'm not just going to give you one child. Right? You're going to be a fruitful vine. Notice, though, that he's filled with doubts, and God gives him this assurance. And we're told in verse 6, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Then verse 7, he also said to them, to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. How's verse 8 start? But, there it is again, right? But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? Again, there's doubt that Abram is expressing. It was gone, 
but now it's back, right? We experience that, though, don't we? There are times that we have doubt, and God answers those doubts, and then other doubts creep in, right? Notice, though, where's the doubt directed this second time? The doubt isn't directed towards God and his ability. You haven't given me a son. How do I know that you're going to keep your word about this? This time it's directed towards himself. How can I know I will gain possession of it? When God says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it, he is reminding Abraham of this great promise that he gave him, this great covenant that he gave him, right? Hey, Abram, we have this relationship. I'll be your God. You'll be my people, right? Just obey me. And that brings up more doubt. How do I know I'm going to be able to complete this task, Lord? First, I'm not even sure if you're going to come through for me, God. I still don't have a child. Then I don't know if I can even live up to this, if I can go in and take this land, right? I don't know if I can live up to my end of the contract, to my end of the covenant. I still have doubts about me, and therefore I don't know how this is even going to work out. God responds, though, in the second half of this passage, and we'll get there, uh, And he'll respond to his doubt in an amazing way, though. But I want you to know that God is open to your doubts. You can bring those before him. I mean, it's pretty interesting here. God shows up and says, I am the Lord. I will do this, right? I will do that. Very clear message. The word of the Lord came to him, and Abram says, how can I be sure that you're going to do all that? This is the God of the universe that he's talking to, that he's questioning. God could have responded by saying, you, you insignificant flea, you gnat, how dare you question me? But he doesn't. He answers him, right? And then when Abraham shows him more doubts, as we're going to see, he'll answer him again in a beautiful way. God is very patient with doubters. You need to realize that. But... He does not let us live or stay in that doubt. He's not going to let us live there. A a couple weeks ago, we talked about doubting Thomas, right? Thomas is not there when Jesus reveals himself to the other, other disciples, but they tell him, Thomas, he's alive. He's risen from the grave, right? And, And Thomas is like, there is no way I'm going to believe you. Not unless I see the scars and touch them for myself, right? Well, what does Jesus do? He meets him where he is. And he says, Thomas, come feel these scars. Come see these things. He doesn't say, how dare you not believe that I rose from the dead? He answers us in our doubts. But he also says to him, quit doubting and believe, right? This is important for us to keep in mind because at times we all doubt or we all struggle with a doubt, right? Sometimes we can be tempted to just live in that place of doubts. Well, this is just how it is. I'm going to always be in doubt about this thing. That is not okay when it comes to God. It's not okay to live in that doubt. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to express those doubts. It's okay to bring those doubts to him. This church is a safe place for that. You can bring your doubts to us, but we're going to help you work through them. He's not going to let you stay in them, right? God will not throw you out because of your doubts. We will not either. You you can spend as much time as you need, but he will work on it. He will talk to you. He will speak to you about those doubts. He he is big enough that you can bring him to him. He's also big enough to answer him and to silence those doubts, all right? All right, let's move to the second doubt Abraham has because God is going to start addressing it in verse 9. It says, So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these things to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. 
God tells Abram, hey, bring me these animals. And, and God and Abram are familiar with each other. They, they know each other. And Abram knows what he is to do. So he cuts the animals in half, but not the birds. He takes the halves and separates them, each on, uh, one on each side, and kind of creates an aisle way between them. Half on one side, half on the other. If, if you aren't familiar with this culture, it probably sounds really weird. doesn't make a whole lot of sense what's going on. But what they're about to do, they're about to enter into a covenant with each other. A, a contract. That would be a, a more modern word today for us. And this is the incredible part. right? Remember, what's Abraham's doubt? What if I can't live up to this? What if I can't live up to my side, my end? And God responds, go get some animals, right? And Abram does. He cuts them apart. God's like, let's make a contract. Let's make a, a covenant. In our culture, we enter into contracts using documents, right? We, we write them out on, on pieces of paper what each side is supposed to do. Usually there's words placed or, or it's digital. And then we, what do we do? We sign our names, to agree to that covenant, to that contract. If we don't live up to what that contract says, then, then that contract is the, the document that is used to hold us accountable to what we said we would do, right? I mean, we might find ourselves in, in a court of law being sued. You may enter into a contract to get work done on your house, right? You, you have an agreed amount that you're agreeing to pay that contractor, and the contractor is agreeing to a certain thing to do in a certain time frame, right? And if one side doesn't keep up with their end, then you can use that contract to hold them accountable to that. That's typical today, typical in a culture where we can write and record things. Back then, though, people didn't write things down. So that wasn't possible. Everything instead was communicated orally. So how did contracts or, or covenants work during this time? Well, each side would verbally say what they were committed to, what they were agreeing to. And then they would act out the consequences if they broke that contract. And what they would do is Right? They would act out the curse of the covenant. Jeremiah 34, verse 18 is an example, and it, it probably will start to make more sense to you now. God says, those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who walked between the pieces of the calf, I will deliver into the hands of the enemy who want to kill them. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. They broke the covenant that they have. Cutting animals in half and then walking between them was a typical way to make a contract or a covenant back then. And what you're doing, you were saying, if I don't do what I say I'm going to do, may I be like one of those animals cut in half. May, may the birds come and pick at my flesh. May the wild animals come and, and, and devour me, right? That's a contract. I think sometimes maybe we should do that. In fact, next time you're, you're going to have some work done on your house, say, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do the typical written contract, let's do this instead and just go grab some animals, cut them in half and create that aisle way and walk, walk between them, right? You, you're buying a car? Listen, I've been burned by these warranties before. You, you always say that these warranties are good, but then there's always some loophole. We're going to do it a little bit differently this time if you want me to sign this contract, right? Or, you know, thwack, cut them in half, walk between them. I guarantee you people will think twice about backing out of the contract if you do that, right? There's one more important thing to know about covenants and contracts back then, though. If you, were, if you made one with a non-equal, if you made one with somebody that was on a much higher status level than you, that person would not walk in between the animals. That person would not 
make that covenant with you. You would have to make it. You would have to commit to that. You would have to walk in between the animals, but that person above you wouldn't have to. For instance, if a king conquered a nation and then uh, came in, uh, he would make everybody walk between those animals and agree, hey, I'm going to be faithful to you, king. And you did that because you were grateful that he wouldn't chop off your head and just kill you right there. So you were gladly going to walk through those animals. But there's no way that that king that person of higher status would walk through those animals. And I'm sure that Abram thought that this was the way it was going to be played out because who's he making this covenant with? To the God of the universe, right? He is God. He is the great king. And I'm sure Abram thought, I'm going to be the one that walks between these animals. But remember Abram's doubts. He's saying, I don't know whether or not I can live up to my end of the contract. So why would he walk through it if he knew what the consequences were going to be, right? If he, if he didn't think he could live up to it, why would he walk through it? And that's where this incredible thing happens next. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's one of the most amazing things in the entire Bible. Here's what happened. He gets all the animals separated on each side. And then verse 12. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick, dreadful darkness came over him. Notice this isn't normal sleep, because it says it's a thick and dreadful darkness. And and the word for dreadful darkness literally means a darkness of, of terror. Terror fell on him. A dread fell on him. A kind of spiritual darkness fell on him that just kind of mirrored the physical darkness. And then God speaks to him and reveals some things. But I want to jump over to verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. I'm told that smoking fire pot and, and, and blazing torch are really hard to translate here. Uh, the one could mean a, a billowing smoke was happening, a, a, a furnace of smoke, and the other could be a lamp of fire, and, and most times it's, it's translated as lightning. These are, these are two words that appear when God appears on, on Mount Sinai, which means these are signs. These are tokens of God's presence. My friends, this is God showing up. The, the second word, blazing torch, is the word, like I said, often used for lightning. And, and I picture this, right, as a streak of lightning that appears, brilliant, hard to look at, right? It holds its shape. You know, we've only ever seen a flash of lightning, but I, I believe this is the, a sign of God, right? And it, and it passes with this billowing furnace between the animals. Just imagine that. Just imagine what Abram seen. Just, just imagine, just realize the significance of this, right? Abram, here's my vow to you. And he passes through the animals. If I don't do everything I do, may I, this is God speaking, may I be like these animals that are killed, that are cut off, that are torn to pieces. That, my friends, is astounding that God would do this, that the high king would do this. Kings didn't walk between animals, but he does, right? And he's showing him hey, if I don't live up to my side of it, let it be like this. That alone is incredible, but it's not the most incredible part. Because we see God go through the pieces in verse 17, but then look at verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Do you realize what just happened? God walks between the pieces and then immediately enters into a covenant with Abraham. It's done. Do you get that? Do you get that? It's incredible, we said, that God walks through the pieces, but it's even more incredible that Abram doesn't. He didn't walk through the pieces. 
right? We got to get this. We got to understand this. They, they each had something they were supposed to do, right? This isn't how it should work out, but not only does God walk through the animals, and God says, I'll pay the penalty if I don't live up to my end of the thing, but he's also saying, I'll pay the penalty if you don't lift up to your side. Do you get that? That's the answer to Abram's doubt. What if I can't live up to this, God? God answers, your faithfulness has nothing to do with this covenant. I've promised you this blessing that it will take place, and it's not up to you. It's not up to your faithfulness. This blessing, this grace comes unconditionally. This covenant is going to happen whether you fail or not. Think about this. How can this work, though? God can't be killed, right? And likely, Abram's going to fail this part. How does that work? Isaiah 53, 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. We, we all have failed on keeping our side of the covenant, right? And the Lord has laid upon him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, right? And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. For he was cut off, covenant language, from the land of of the living for the transgressions of my people he was punished. My friends, this points to Jesus. Remember the darkness? Mark 15, 33, at noon darkness came over the whole land when Jesus went to the cross. Darkness came, thick darkness, the darkness of terror and dread. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabatni, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, in the form of Jesus, who took on flesh, paid the debt of the covenant so that we could be blessed even though we failed him. That's what this event with Abraham foreshadows. It's a picture of the covenant to come, right? You need to know this. You need to understand this, right? Salvation is not dependent on you. If it was, you'd lose it all the time, every time you sinned. It's not dependent on you. You don't walk through the animals, you don't go to the cross. He did. We just have to believe in him and put our faith and trust in him. My friends, that's why it's grace. It's unearned. There's nothing we can do, right? Galatians 3, 13 through 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This, my friends, is what we remember, and this is why we praise him. This is why we thank him today. When, when people say that all religions are the same and that all paths lead to God, no, no, my friends, there is no other religion that looks like this. There is no other religion on the planet that God comes and suffers and dies. None. So that we could be blessed. There is no other God who walks the aisle way between the animals and doesn't require man to do the same thing. We have a religion of grace. We have a religion of forgiveness. There is no other religion that says it doesn't matter how big of a failure you are, you are because 
I've done it all. All you have to do is put your faith in me. All you have to do is confess me as your Lord and put your trust in me. Amen? God's grace alone. Some of you will not have communion because you'll think you're undeserving of it. That's the point. You are. I am. The closer I grow to God, the more I realize how undeserving I am of God's grace. But that's the point. I didn't have to walk through the animals. He did. He makes the way. It's all on him. To not to take part in this is to reject him and re- reject what he did and reject his amazing gift to us. Don't do it. Do it with the right heart. Do it by saying, I am nothing but a wretched scumbag whatever. And my only hope, the only hope I have is that what you did was true and that you died for me and I put my faith in you. Amen? We're going to have communion together. It is a time to remember what he did. It is a time to give him all praise and all honor. It is not a time to think, man, I just don't deserve it. You don't. Let's settle that once and for all, all right? But it's not about you earning it. It's about what he did for us. Let's focus now on what we do in response to that amazing gift that he gave us, right? Let's determine right now to live for him. Let's determine right now to to lay down our lives and to, to live out for him in any way that he calls us to do. But don't you dare put your salvation on you because you can't earn it. It's by his gift. And all you have to ask yourself is, do I accept that? Do I confess that? Like I've said, man, I am, I am no good. There is nothing good in me. It is only by God's grace that I can stand before him. Amen? Luke twenty-two fourteen. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Today, we remember what he did for us, right? He was a substitute for us. He took our place. Let us eat this and give him praise. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. I hope you always read that passage a little differently. Which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. We recognize this new covenant he has brought us in. In this covenant, he promises that if we will believe him, if we will put our faith and trust in him, that we, if we will confess that he is Lord, he will save us. Amen?
John 6, 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift you have given us. We thank you that it's not dependent on us. We thank you for this amazing, life-changing message. We thank you for this amazing, life-changing relationship. Lord, let us not be people who keep it to ourselves. Give us an opportunity to share this message with somebody that we come into contact with this week. Lord, give us the boldness. Give us the words to say to do it. Father, we love you and we give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.